Initiation of hostilities by Starfleet officers will not be tolerated. But should our visitors decide to initiate hostilities, you have permission to respond with force. Is that clear? Aye, sir. Shall we? What's up, Lore Masters? In this episode, I wanted to break down if Admiral Vance was warranted in his last demand when presented with a chance to merge the Federation with the Emerald Chain. I want peace. I want the Emerald Chain to unite with the Federation. I'm gonna have to expand on that one. The Emerald Chain will desist from any so-called Prime Directive violations moving forward, and I commit to a 15-year systematic walk back from Quajon and any other worlds like it. For those who need a refresher, Osira promises to completely reform the Emerald Chain, outlawing slavery, the use of technology that facilitates slavery, and a 15-year plan to make the Emerald Chain Prime Directive compliant. However, everything comes to a screeching halt when Vance demands that the last piece of the agreement, the one thing they must do, is install someone else to be the voice of the Emerald Chain, and that Osira must stand trial for her crimes. Osira, your people are good. I beg you to be as good as they are. I can promise you justice. Oh, I can promise you the same. This, of course, incenses Osira and the negotiations completely fall through. Outright war seems to be the only recourse after this is said. However, here is a question. Was Vance reasonable in his demand? Was this something that Starfleet was known for? And even if it's not, is it something that Starfleet should be known for? Ironically, when the fandom thinks about Starfleet, they generally focus on the next generation. They rarely look at how Starfleet actually works in the original series and Deep Space Nine. Voyager and Enterprise are also somewhat outliers in this discussion, given one is way away from Starfleet, that's the point, and the other is the United Earth's Starfleet, not the Federation's, so a different entity. While doing research, I found over 16 treaties had been signed by the Federation that we're aware of. This includes the Treaty of Armands, the Treaty of Algeron, the Kittermer Accords, and many more. Of the 16, at least two of these ceded planets in dispute to the opposing side of the Federation, with another treaty banning the use of certain weapons altogether. There's yet another three treaties that create neutral or demilitarized zones of some sort that neither side can enter or use the resources thereof. The others were basically either peace treaties, armistices, or agreements on how to deal with prisoners of war, criminals, and other disputes. Of all of these treaties and peace accords, a grand total of one required the surrender of someone to stand punishment for their crimes at the end of hostilities. That was specifically the Dominion War that lit the entire Alpha and Beta quadrants on fire, leaving them in shambles. Some might try to argue that the Thomas Riker incident was also one, but this wasn't a condition of some treaty, but more just keeping the peace. And there are some agreements that required extradition, but that doesn't seem to fit in with what we're discussing here. It's also well worth noting that some of these treaties included the Romulans and the Klingons. You know, the empires who early on would take over entire planets and subjugate the people for their own use, essentially making them slaves and ultimately keeping them that way even into the 24th century. Those instances were also not the only times that the Federation was willing to let evil exist for peace. The Zinti and other species would be given similar accord and their breaking of the various treaties ignored by Starfleet. Honestly, the modus operandi of the Federation is generally just to ignore or ask people to stop doing bad things. However, there is also somewhat of an insidious project behind the works of the Federation, and I'm not talking about Section 31. Whether they were doing it on purpose or not, often the Federation would agree to unreasonable peace terms, and then through the Federation's culture and instigating trade embargoes, they would force other nations to do what they want, ultimately even changing those nations. So while the agreement themselves was largely one-sided, in the end, the culture of the Federation won the day. This is something that we see happen with the Klingons, arguably the Dominion, and the Romulans. But focusing back on Admiral Vance, the Starfleet that he was the CIC of was very, very different. 
Unlike the scientific behemoth that was the 23rd and 24th century, as well as 25th, 26th, and so on, the 32nd one does not have a focus on the sciences. They aren't as powerful and are really reduced to even less than what the 23rd century Starfleet had. For all intents and purposes, it's almost like a 22nd century Starfleet. The resources were limited and they can only afford to be at one engagement at a time. Hell, war with a mercantile group could mean the actual destruction of the Federation. In fact, based on the dialogue, we might be able to parse out that this is an actual merger that would more make the Federation a part of the Emerald Chain than the Emerald Chain a part of the Federation. Sarah, I want peace. I want the Federation to join the chain, and I want to learn from your great society. The name would stay to keep the good faith the Federation and Starfleet has garnered, but honestly, Starfleet is just being absorbed. But it's worth noting, even with Starfleet so diminished, they're doing what I had stated beforehand. They're changing the culture of the Emerald Chain. The chain would conform to what the Federation wanted, the Federation's accepted way of life. Everyone's lives would be much better because of this. So the question becomes, did Vance push too far by wanting a woman to stand trial for the crimes that she had committed? Make no mistake, even if she did it for the good of the chain and to help people, Osira was a murderer. She killed her own nephew and wasn't above torture. She moved species into extinction and used pre-warp civilizations for her own measures. She had a lot of blood on her hands, and the Federation agreeing with her being the leader after a merger would probably mean the galaxy would never trust them. Perhaps even thinking that Starfleet and everything it stood for had betrayed them. However, she could have had a puppet, even if no trial happened. If the face isn't there, it probably wouldn't have been as bad, though some would see it for what it is. And there's where the rub lies. At the end of the day, Starfleet has lost almost everything. They're a shadow of themselves. They are basically a substantial power, but don't ultimately sway events. In order to enact change, they'd have to go all in and possibly lose everything. And it's because of that, I honestly think the most Starfleet thing to do, the thing that encompasses the Federation values the most, is to require her to stand trial for her actions. It's not something that Starfleet has required most of its existence, but it is something that it probably should have. The safest and most pragmatic thing to have done, though, would have been to agree to the terms without her facing punishment. It would have saved a lot of lives, but it would have come at the expense of the soul of the Federation. And after that, the question really becomes, could he have lived with it?